So I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to this program and giving me an opportunity to tell you about an application of the conformal bootstrap. So the long-range Ising model is easy enough to define. It comes from this lattice Hamiltonian where instead of summing over nearest neighbors, you sum over all pairs of sites where the interaction decays with the distance like a power law. And everything that I'm going to say applies to the case when J and S are positive. So facts about this model go back almost 50 years. Um, one difference compared to the short-range model is that it doesn't just have a second-order phase transition in two and three dimensions. It has critical behavior in one dimension as well. And the earliest approach to studying its critical exponents was the method of Wilson and Fisher, where you start from a continuum field theory in the UV and deform by an interaction that preserves C2 symmetry. So if we make S large enough, we expect that this function will decay rapidly enough that the system will cross over to the short-range universality class. And on the other hand, if S becomes too small, then phi to the fourth will be irrelevant and the mean field theory will become exact. So this is the non-trivial region where I'm going to be interested in the model. Now first, I should mention that Monte Carlo results are limited to one and two dimensions currently. Even though I'm sure this audience is up to the challenge, 3D simulations are very difficult because of the need to keep track of interactions over arbitrarily large scales. We don't expect the conformal bootstrap to suffer these difficulties because it doesn't perform a direct simulation at all. It focuses on constraining an operator algebra. And finally, this is a valid approach because the fixed point was proven to be conformal in 2015. So if we want to go from the lattice to the continuum, it's helpful to think about this action where the kinetic term is non-local, and it's what I'm going to call a mean field theory or generalized free theory. And this is completely Gaussian, endpoint functions factorize into two-point functions. And the only difference compared to a regular free theory is that there's no stress energy tensor, and phi has dimension d minus s over 2 instead of d minus 2 over 2. And therefore, it's easy enough to show that with the quartic interaction, the flow that it induces will be perturbative if 2s minus d is a small positive number. Now, as epsilon goes to zero, we expect the theory to have divergences. But one nice thing is that the divergences are local, and therefore there's no way they can modify the non-local kinetic term. So a consequence is that phi holds on to its original dimension of d minus s over 2, even at the quantum level. And we can test this with a Feynman diagram we know and love. This calculation gives one gamma function that has a negative argument, but it's not a negative integer, it's just some fraction. So there's no pole and no subtraction that we have to do. And you might worry that the situation changes at higher loops, but it doesn't, and this has recently been proven by mathematicians. And now going through some primary operators, uh, these are the scaling dimensions at the mean field theory. And then at the short range crossover, the leading spin two operator takes on dimension D, phi squared takes on the dimension of the short range energy operator, and phi takes on the dimension of the short range spin operator. Um, and because of the normal normalization, this relation actually defines the value of S star. So once we understand the endpoints, we can imagine something like this. So this is a plot from the homepage of the Bootstrap collaboration. And the only thing I've done is added in this arrow to show that the mean field theory is clearly within the blue region. And this is the region that's allowed by the constraints of crossing symmetry and unitarity on a single four-point function. And now it's easy to imagine that the line of fixed points depending on S interpolates between these two regions and perhaps in a way that can be understood with further numerics in the conformal bootstrap. But one thing that requires explanation is how this fits in with a plot that Madalena drew in her talk, which improves upon this by considering constraints due to three correlators. So in this case, there's an island around the Ising model and clearly it's not possible anymore to interpolate to the mean field theory with a continuous path. So it must be that one of the assumptions used by the authors was too strong for our case. And it was. They assumed that sigma and epsilon were the only relevant scalars that were primary under the conformal group. And our model actually has a third. So this is the operator that we've been calling phi cubed. Um, phi cubed in the usual Wilson-Fisher fixed point is a descendant of phi because of this equation of motion. 
And if we write the analogous equation of motion for the non-local action, we find that it fixes the dimension of phi cubed, so we have another non-renormalization theorem, but it doesn't put it in any multiplet other than its own. So we have to regard phi cubed as an independent primary still. And this equation of motion allows us to do more. So if I go back to the integral form of it, instead of this funny fractional derivative, we can write it in this way. And here n1 and n3 are normalization functions, because the bare fields in the Lagrangian will have a two-point normalization that depends on s. And from now on, I want to think of phi and phi cubed as being unit normalized operators. So we can use this equation to relate an endpoint function with phi to an endpoint function with phi cubed. And it's particularly convenient when we do this for a three-point function involving scalars, because these are fixed kinematically up to a constant. And when we perform the integral using the semantic star formula, we find that the ratio of OPE coefficients is the ratio of normalizations uh, multiplied by this object, which consists just of nice gamma functions. And we can cancel the normalization if we introduce a further two operators, three and four. And then we arrive at this remarkable formula, which tells us how infinitely many OPE coefficients in the long-range Ising model have to conspire. And thinking about this operator led us to a very nice result, which came out last year. And it resolves a paradox, because the dimension of phi and the dimension of phi cubed add up to d, so we say that one is the shadow of the other. However, if you go to the short-range Ising model, if you imagine that's, that that's the theory you arrive at when you go to the crossover at S star, there are not pairs of scalars in that theory whose dimensions add up to d. So it must be that the real theory you have is partially the short-range Ising model, along with a decoupled sector that has a free field with the shadow dimension. And once you consider this action, sigma times chi becomes an operator which turns out to be marginally irrelevant. And you can use this in conformal perturbation theory to flow to a fixed point. And by all indications, it's the same fixed point. So this passes a number of checks. The arguments in the previous slide showed that phi was exact to zero loops and phi cubed was exact to one loop. In the dual picture, it's reversed. So chi is exact to zero loops and sigma is exact to one loop. And also, up to an assumption that we make about the normalizations, which we think is valid, we reproduce the non-perturbative OPE ratio. And also, this resolves the puzzle of how the theory becomes non-local. Because we need chi to write down um, the divergence of the would-be stress tensor. So chi is not, um, not some auxiliary field. It's completely physical. So because of this, our motivation for bootstrapping the theory is twofold. In addition to pinning down the critical exponents more precisely, it would also be good to use numerics to subject this duality to further testing. So now, if we jump into it, we start off with a four-point function of scalars. And this is a generalization of the formula that Pedro wrote in his talk, which was the four-point function of identical scalars. And we expand this conformal ansatz in the standard three-dimensional conformal blocks. And that gives us an S-channel expression. And then we want to make this equivalent to the same evaluation in a different OPE channel. So we would permute the labels until we get a T-channel expression, and then set them equal to each other. And when the dust settles, we end up with crossing equations which look like this in terms of functions f plus and f minus, which have come to be called convolved conformal blocks. Now, they have indices i, j, k, and l relating to these operators. And these need to be allowed to run over all of the four-point functions that we're considering in the crossing symmetry equation. Now, we, we've limited this to scalars. And the relevant scalars we know about are sigma, epsilon, and chi, to use the notation in the dual theory. And therefore, it's easy to see that there are nine four-point functions we can write down that are consistent with Z2 symmetry. 
However, it'll be much easier if we limit ourselves to six and the results that we get turn out to be exactly the same. So I'm going to consider three correlators with identical scalars and three correlators with mixed scalars. And then for the identical crossing equations, we just get this, which is very familiar. Here, i can be either sigma, epsilon, or chi. And then each mixed correlator gives a set of three crossing equations, where i, j can be sigma, epsilon, sigma, chi, or epsilon, chi. And in total, the number of crossing equations is 12. So we can write the crossing equations as a quadratic form, treating A as a 3 by 3 matrix, and uh, B, C, and D are 1 by 1 matrices. And the entries depend on these f functions, f of delta L. Now, the bootstrap is all about searching for functionals that act on these vectors in a desired way. And when n runs from 1 to 12, we have to remember that these are components that depend on u and v. And to really search for functionals numerically, we can't have an infinite dimensional problem. We need to do some Taylor expansion so that they don't depend on u and v anymore. And then these original vectors with 12 components become vectors with hundreds or thousands of components. So now we can imagine that we choose some guess for delta sigma, delta epsilon, and delta chi. That's really guessing two operators because delta sigma has to be the shadow of delta chi. But if we make that guess and we find a functional that's positive on every conformal block vector of this dimension, every conformal block vector of that dimension, and every conformal block vector of this dimension, and whenever the dimension is between 3 and infinity, for the irrelevant scalars, that describes every possible operator dimension that could possibly show up in the long-range Ising model that we're trying to bootstrap. And therefore, we've ruled out the initial guess. We've gotten a sum of positive terms equal to zero, and therefore, we've turned crossing symmetry into a contradiction. So scanning over these dimensions and making an exclusion plot, um, showing the points where a functional can be found and the points where a functional cannot be found, we end up with this plot where, as promised, the kink for the short-range Ising model is once again continuously connected to the mean field theory over here because of the third relevant scalar. And now the next step is to make this more restrictive to see if we can find a kink somewhere on the interior. And the way that we do that is we raise the gap for spin two operators. So if we set it to 3.1, the functional doesn't need to be positive on conformal block vectors of dimension 3 anymore. And therefore, it's easier to find a functional, it's easy to rule out points, and we get a more restricted region. So doing this five times, we end up with something that is a little disappointing, because the regions become more restrictive, but they're very smooth, and we can't find a kink anymore. So I still have no idea where the interesting model lies from this plot. And this reflects an interesting piece of lore in the bootstrap, which I think is not fully understood. Every time you add new correlators to your system, that only helps you if you use them to make spectral assumptions that you couldn't make with the old system. And so far, just demanding crossing symmetry and unitarity, um, it doesn't matter that we've included chi and used six correlators. We get the exact same result that we would have found with three correlators. So there's one more formula that we can impose, which crucially depends on the fact that we have correlators involving chi, and that is a quadratic relation between these OPE coefficients, which comes from the non-perturbative ratio. And once we impose that, we seem to be in business, because we have a sharper kink at the short-range Ising model, and the allowed regions reach a very narrow throat at the mean field theory, and some interesting features have also started to appear in the other bounds. So in particular, the bound for a spin-2 gap of 3.4 has this little piece that sticks out, but the bound for 3.3 has a different feature. And 
it turns out to only have that feature because these numerics have not converged very well yet. So in the next plot I'm going to show you, I've computed the Taylor expansion to a higher order. Um, they involve about twice as many terms. And now we see that the bound for 3.3 and the bound for 3.4 both have this kink without it dipping too far below into the region where it disagrees with perturbation theory. So this is a preliminary plot. There are some points that haven't finished being computed yet, but I think it shows the essential features that we were looking for, because once we plot the results of the two-loop epsilon expansion, they seem to go pretty close to the kinks where these, uh, where these regions have a large second derivative. And there's one more check that we can perform. So going back to the crossing equations, we can see that there are only two types of operators, the, the Z2 even kind and the Z2 odd kind, and yet they can show up in more than one OPE. So the sigma chi OPE and the Bose symmetric OPEs should contain the same types of operators, but a priori they don't have to be the same as far as these crossing equations are concerned. So therefore it's helpful if we can look at the allowed region where valid CFTs can exist and actually extract a spectrum that satisfies the crossing symmetry condition. And we can do that using something called the extremal functional method, but only if we're at the very edge of the bound. So what we do is we go to the edge where it's still possible to find a functional, and then look at the scaling dimensions that correspond to zeros of the functional. And those turn out to be uh, the spectrum for a theory that's just inside the bound. So I've done that at these points. And I've plotted the first irrelevant operator of spin 0 and the first operator of spin 2 that's above delta t. And I've plotted them in the sigma chi OPE as well as the Bose symmetric OPEs. And it seems that it's only on the left-hand side where we get a good crossing of the lines. So the red lines appear to cross once, and the blue lines appear to cross twice. But in every case, the position where they cross is roughly equivalent to where we would spot the kink from looking at these plots. So this is the uh, extent of my numerical results. And now to conclude, we've seen that by allowing CFTs to be non-local, our region for allowed CFTs can become much larger. And the long-range Ising model I would just view as a proof of concept. There are probably many other CFTs we could find. And in particular, we could repeat the story for the vector model analog. Now, this plot appeared to have some shortcomings. In particular, the kink did not survive at a gap of 3.25. So it's really only half of the non-trivial region where we found an estimate for the long-range Ising critical exponents. Also, in addition to finding more kinks, we would probably like to find islands, as has been done for the short-range Ising model and the OFN vector models. And at the risk of getting into speculation, I just want to mention that the most promising route towards getting there is probably including the spin-2 operator in our system of external correlators. So this would use techniques that are very similar to an impressive paper from August which bootstrapped a four-point function of 3D stress tensors. And if we allow that spin-2 operator to be non-conserved and include scalars in the system, then it's going to become even more numerically intensive, but nevertheless, it should be possible in the future. Also, one thing I didn't mention at all was what happens in two dimensions. And there, it turns out that it's not possible to find kinks anymore. The bounds in two dimensions have, um, have some interesting properties, which makes it harder to find kinks. It might just be that there are so many more theories in two dimensions that the ones we're looking for are getting lost in a larger haystack. Uh, 
But again, we haven't tried bootstrapping a spin two operator in the in the external correlator. And correlators of spin two operators in two dimensions are non-trivial once we don't have Virasoro symmetry anymore. So this relates to a paper um, also from August, which performed a numerical bootstrap of a two-dimensional theory that was non-local, so it had no stress tensor. And they were interested in a very different problem, uh, namely quantum field theory and ADS, but they still got some interesting physics out of it. So I would like to try this as well. And finally, in recent years, there have been hints that we can get pretty far by combining this type of uh, numerical analysis with analytic approaches to the bootstrap. And in some ways, these methods are good for, sorry, in, in some ways, the long-range Ising model is good because it doesn't have uh, an infinite tower of higher spin currents. But in some ways, it's bad because it doesn't have a spin two operator that's conserved either. And therefore, it becomes hard to identify the operator with smallest twist, the operator with second smallest twist and third smallest twist and so on. But still, by extracting the spectrum and getting a sense of what the twists of the actual operators are in plots like this, we might be able to do something. So it'll be interesting to see which of these work out. And thank you. Yep. Very naive question. Why do you care about kink? I love the kink? physics, but the kink is not necessarily physics. But uh, is it empirically interesting, or is there any logic that kink turns island? Well, it, it relies on the unreasonable effectiveness of the bootstrap. We still don't have a good explanation for yeah. why. So I know that in the first, uh, that very impressive picture of the 3D ising, that the kink was first observed, that it turned island later. But I wonder if there are any other example of such miracle happened. If it always happens, then you, probably, at least empirically, we should believe that kink is interesting. But uh, is there any counterexample that kink just disappeared and island didn't appear? I, I, I'm worried. If it, it's not guaranteed that the kink is always uh, related to an island, then... Yeah, that's true. There are some kinks that are still under debate as to whether they correspond to interesting or whether they correspond to theories at all. And there's another paper I didn't mention where they looked at four-dimensional theories with n equal to one supersymmetry. And there's a kink that shows up when you do this with a single correlator. And it continues to be a kink when you add more correlators, and they haven't managed to turn it into an island yet. OK, thanks. Sorry, I'm, I'm confused as to why you say there's no stress tensor, because um, I can vary with respect to the metric. Your, your non-local term is the geodetic interval, which does depend on the metric. So there is a variation with respect to the metric, and I can extract the stress tensor. Presumably, the answer may be that it's not conserved. But I'm, I'm confused as to um, the way you're thinking about it. You could do that, but I think you would get an operator non-local. So when I say there's no stress tensor, I mean there's no stress tensor in the set of local operators, which is how we think about CFTs usually. Maybe. Maybe line operators or something could could give you something that that you would regard as a stress tensor in some respects. It will be as local as your uh, third derivative of um, or your s derivative of phi. Yeah, s derivatives are non-local. So when I say there's no stress tensor, I mean there's no local operator of dimension two. Sorry, dimension d and spin two. I have a couple of questions. So, so when you did the bootstrap for all the, uh, including three scalars, so you always assumed one of them is a shadow of another. Yep. So, so that that is just put into the bootstrap uh, conditions. Yeah, and that greatly improves the efficiency. So I can do a two-dimensional scan instead of three dimensions. Okay. And uh, another thing I was asking was that uh, so. Are there analog, are there known examples where you get this kind of theories where you just have some generalized free fields kind of thing in other dimensions, in 4D, for example? So in, in 4D, S star and D over 2 coincide, 
and the non-trivial region for these models is empty. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, the search for non-local CFTs is underexplored, and there could be more interesting ones in 4D. But but do, do any of the models that we know, like say n equal to four or something, do you, is there some expectation at some regime that it will behave like uh, you you will have a sector which you can bootstrap and study? That's what you mean a non-local version of n equal to four. Uh, where you so so you can so we know that n equal to four at some point at large lambda large n does the spectrum you can treat to some extent as generalized free fields, right? Yeah, so um, the question is that, you know, like, can you just truncate? And, and, and in, in some sense, that's what supergravity does. It truncates to just some set of uh, supergravity multiplet, and, and, um, and at some level, it is generalized free fields before you start uh, turning in interactions, turning on interactions. But, uh, but, but do you think, you know, that kind of examples can be accessed in this kind of a way? Is that... Well, I think that behavior underlies uh, much of the promise of, okay, the slide's too far away, um, of the analytic methods that have been developed recently, having control over um, a non-trivial interacting theory and some kinematic limit. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, last, and uh, I, I promise. So this 3D uh, long-range uh, model, can it be supersymmetrized in any sense? Or? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the short-range model can be supersymmetrized, so... I would expect that that the same procedure might work here. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker.